Welcome to Job Sharing and Beyond, the Future of Work podcast that goes beyond the traditional 9 to 5. I am Karen Tischler, speaker, consultant, and host of the show, where we hear from global experts every other week to discover innovative solutions and tips on how to remain a relevant employer in the future. I am very appreciative to have Ian Dinwiddie as my guest today. Ian is the founder of Inspiring Dads, a coaching and mentoring business specializing in working with men who want to be great dads and have great careers. Ian believes strongly that supporting dads with their work and life balance, normalizing flexible working and parental leave has powerful benefits for improving well-being and retention, building diverse and inclusive workplaces, and closing the gender pay gap. In our conversation, we covered a lot of topics, from why he started his organization, that dads can do any type of caring except breastfeeding, to why a time of solo parenting is important for dads. Ian also spoke about the identity of being a full-time carer dad and how male role models are important for other dads, using Bill Gates as an awesome example. Ian explained how he educates people about being a dad carer one person at a time, the importance of flexible work, and his talk at Flexpo on September 16th. Last, but certainly not least, he gave examples of soft skills he has learned as a carer and talked about the importance of shared family goals. Before we start the show, you may be wondering why I'm still producing weekly instead of bi-weekly podcast shows, even though International Podcast Day, which was on September 30th, is over. In celebration for that awesome day, full of global podcasting, I had released weekly instead of bi-weekly podcast shows in September. Well, the wonderful news is that I have found so many great guests for my show that I wanted to share them with you more frequently. I have therefore decided to extend having weekly instead of bike weekly shows until the end of 2020. If you have missed any of the previous episodes, please head over to emilyspath.ca, which is E M I L Y S P A T H dot C A to listen to them and to subscribe to your favorite listening platform. Also, don't forget to sign up for Emily's Past Consulting's newsletter on the website. It includes a Q&A interview, interesting research findings, updates on previous guests and previews of future guests. And the next edition of it is going to come out on Halloween. But now, without further ado, let's start the show. Thank you so much for coming onto the show, Ian, today. Hi, Karen. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and I'm looking forward to chatting about job sharing and beyond. Thank you. Yes. So we have, so far, we have listeners from 16 different countries across five different continents. So I always want to make sure that people know where my guests are situated. So could you tell us a little bit about where you are and any food or site that people should be looking out for when they come to your area? Yeah, well, that's, that's really impressive. Um, it's much more impressive than the podcast I host, where we had our first uh, we had our first international guest, uh, a man from Australia, um, just just this week. So I'm in southeast London, so a place called Bromley, which was one time part of a county called Kent, but really it's London. We elect a London mayor, so we're inside the M25, which is a big orbital motorway that goes around the outside of London. Uh, and food-wise, I mean, the British, I think we've been very 
good at kind of absorbing influences from other places. So if you go to our local uh, Michelin starred restaurant, um, which we do on occasion, then it would be definitely be described as modern European. So it's a fusion of French and Italian and sort of oh, sort of more traditional English food styles. But in terms of places to come and see near Bromley, so we are very, very close, about four miles away from where Charles Darwin lived and where he wrote The Origin of Species. And we're also only about seven or eight miles away from where Sir Winston Churchill lived and his country residence, a place called Westerham, Chartwell House, uh, which are places we've been to, which are both, you know, uh, both significant figures in English history are pretty close to us, really. Wow. OK, I've lived in England for nine years, but I have not come close to your area. So definitely a reason to come back and visit. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good when you've got sort of history like that, sort of just just there. And actually, England, right. we're pretty lucky, I think, in England in terms of you can you can pick up a bit of history in, in most places, some older than others. Yeah. So now, um, Ian, you're the founder of Inspiring Dads. Could you tell our listeners more about why and how you started it? Yeah, I guess the it all goes back more than 10 years, really. Um, I, I was working as a management consultant. My my wife is a lawyer in a, a London um, law firm. Well, actually, it's a bit more global than that, but she's based in London. And when we were sort of planning what our lives might look like in terms of children, then we had we we knew that one of us would need to change the way they worked to a certain degree, because my work, my wife, was working very long hours, she still does. So typical day might be leaving the house at seven and back at nine o'clock at night. Uh, and as a consultant, I was working away from home four nights a week typically. And we knew that wasn't so, sort of sustainable without, you know, kind of grandparents of which none of our, neither of our grandparents um, are, you know, neither set of grandparents are nearby in any shape or form. Um, and we didn't really want to go down the route of having a nanny or anyone who was sort of looking after the children on a long term basis. And so we we planned quite a long way ahead in terms of our circumstances. And I think I actually gave in my notice at my the job I was doing at the time with about nine months before I actually wanted to leave. Wow. And so what we um, worked out was that for financial reasons and sort of practical reasons in terms of both my wife's income relative to mine, um, the scope for earning more, uh, scope for management consultants to actually do freelance work, which I did quite successfully when um, my daughter was quite young, uh, meant that I was best place actually to step back and stop work altogether. And so I took two weeks of, I took my two weeks of statutory paternity leave when Freya was born in, uh, in 2010. January 2010 and then I worked four days a week which was brilliant really great um, support from the client and from my team so I did did that and then I stopped altogether uh, and then we had a kind of a two three week sort of handover kind of joint parenting bit and then I was off into solo parenting and I did that it was just Freya and I from when she was six months old until I, until she was 15 months old and then she went to nursery a couple of days a week. And I just kind of carried on this sort of pattern for uh, for a while, did some freelance work, uh, did some, you know, I worked on Monday, uh, Monday, Thursday and a Friday on a project, which was quite interesting. Um, and also a Thursday and a Friday on something based in Holland, all kinds of all kinds of things that mm -hmm. but long term we knew that couldn't wasn't wasn't really feasible. Um, but my wife was uh, on a leadership development course through her business. And she said that the coaching that she was receiving was very similar to some of the things, seemed very similar from theme, some of the things I really liked about management consultancy. So I started to look into it, discovered that someone I really liked, really respected, who I used to work with had become a coach, started digging into it. So actually coaching is a really, really good fit for the things I really enjoy about helping people within a business environment. And so it really it went from there, it was looking for some I was looking for something that would fit around the primary need was that I would be the kind of lead parent from a practical point of view I'd be doing the the drop-offs and pickups at school later on obviously nursery is much much longer days school with a nine till three it's a very different um very different sort of set of circumstances but I was looking for something that would make that could fit around that and I discovered coaching and really really enjoyed it and I ended up niching down into working dads so helping stressed dads to balance work and fatherhood 
Um, and it's really about helping men to navigate how to be a great dad and to have a great career at the same time, which I think sometimes it's hard to know who to talk to when you're when you're starting out as a new dad. There's lots of different pressures. Yeah. So now, like, why did you pick then the name Inspiring Dads? Well, that it was probably the hardest business decision. I think everyone sort of ums and ers about <laughs> what they're going to call their business, and they want to be right. really clever about it and that sort of thing. I wanted, I wanted to get my initials are ID, and in, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get two words that would or three words. I wanted to use my initials, so purely <laughs> selfishly, ego, completely ego driven. I wanted to find find three words or, or or something like that that would that would come together, and it was actually my, my wife who is um, a very very clever smart person turned around and said, uh, "What about inspiring dads?" And I was like, "Ooh." That really, that really works. And I think it, it, for me, it works on two levels, both in terms of I'm hoping to inspire dads to do things differently. And also I want to collect together and I do collect together a community of dads who can inspire others. So it works on, on sort of those three levels, <laughs> both the ego driven side that it's my initials, but also the fact that I want to inspire dads to look at things differently and to collect people who can be inspiring to other people. So that's really how it came about. It was, uh, and I can't take a huge amount of credit. I have a, somewhere I had a long, long list of uh, my middle name's Richard. So I had lots of I, I had lots of I's and R's and D's <laughs> and I was playing around. I, I hadn't, um, I hadn't worked it out. And suddenly my wife, we were at soft play watching the kids play. And uh, she said, what about inspiring dads? Like, yeah, that, that could be it. So yeah, that's how it came about. I really like, the name i you know I, I think it's so important that um there is somebody who really can inspire dads because there aren't many organizations as far as i'm aware worldwide really that do that and that really if if one is a dad and struggles with yeah the, the identity and everything i think it's just awesome that you know, you exist and, um, you know, and, and the name, it makes it really easy. If, if I'm somebody looking for it, I look at your name and I'm like, okay, that's, Hopefully. <laughs> it, 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 no, I think it, it sounds really positive. Yeah. Um, and so now when I was doing my research about you, I came across this quote of yours and it says, I'm a major advocate of workplaces providing at least one compulsory dad-to-dad -dad mentoring session when men return to work after the birth of their children. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, I, th I think it comes back to helping men to process the emotional upheaval that they faced. I think it's... It, I think in some ways it's very different for men as it is for women in sort of the preparation side of things and emotionally men are in a slightly different place they're not carrying physically carrying a baby so they're not thinking it's not so immediate for them in many ways and they're they're quite aware that you know for many men then certainly in the uk then the most leave they're going to get is two weeks if they're self-employed there's no statutory leave at all um there's a, you know, there's a bare sort of minimum um, amount in terms of those two weeks that a lot of dads kind of have. And they're quite sort of, in some way, what they tend to be focused on, I think, guys, is that they're focused on the single income um, challenge that might be coming their way and mm -hmm. how exactly they're going to sort of process that. So they might feel um, that they need to redouble their efforts at work and actually work harder than they have done before and to provide and to, to mm -hmm. kind of follow that kind of you know, well-trodden path as a, as a breadwinner. Um, and I think it's quite easy for men to get blinkered on one path and one way of doing things and maybe ignore some of the, the other aspects that have been going on for them. And almost forcing well no, it is forcing i actually think <laughs> i i believe that uh, you know if no matter how long the leave has been then talking to a dad who has been through walked in your shoes who is a little bit uh more experienced in terms of fatherhood maybe the children are a couple of years old five years old whatever it might be to just have that kind of quiet space to say, well, how's it been? What's been the hardest thing? What weren't you expecting? Just to kind of protect a little bit of time so that that new dad 
has an opportunity to talk to someone independent, someone who's not a mate who they tend to spend time, you know, having a drink down the pub, that sort of thing. Well, that's not, that is a different type of conversation and ring fencing that time so they can say, actually, it's really, really hard. And I'm really worried about how I'm worried about my partner's postnatal depression, whatever it might be, but give them an out, give them time and an outlet to explore some of that emotional trauma, because I think men are very good at not exploring it and bottling it up and being brave and putting on a brave face for everyone else. And, you know, often that's what couples need, the man to be strong, but you can't be strong forever. And I think having someone you can turn to and process, I think is really, a really important part of, you know, improving new dad's mental health in particular and being, being confident about how you're doing things and feeling like it, it will be okay. You know, there's a long, long tradition of men muddling through and getting there, but if you can right. make it a little bit quicker and easier, then I think there's, there's big benefits for everyone. Yeah, it's, it sounds to me also, it helps men then to, when they come back, it's like, not just, okay, you're a dad now and let's move on. Nothing yeah. has changed, right? Because often I think people think, well, you know, it was the mom who gave birth, etc., and And forget that from an emotional point of view, everything changes too. So I think that's a really, really good idea. Yeah. I think it can catch, I think it can catch men unawares just yeah. how um how emotionally uh you know how emotionally traumatic and how how emotionally drained the process can be especially when you're walking out the house and you're leaving you're leaving your your new your new child and your and your partner leaving them at home and, right. it, and if it's hard then you'll feel like you're walking away and you're abandoning them then you're torn in two different directions it's uh right. it's something that does need processing i think yeah well um you know there was another quote um i really liked doing my research there were so mm. many quotes so the, the next quote i really enjoyed was um the time spent being a full-time dad is a major driver of equality in the home just experiencing a few months of solo parenting completely changes your perspective of the scale and pressures involved in looking after young children on your own um now can you talk about that more? And do you know many dads that actually have taken a longer paternal leave? I think I'm starting to know more and more. Um, I mean, on my own, from my own personal circumstances, and I didn't take extended leave per se, I guess I, I took, I basically took extended leave from six months for nine months. So, so I was solo parenting. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think the thing the thing the reason why this is really important is that if we think about workplaces um there's an assumption that men uh that men aren't going to take leave they're not going to seek out flexible working and equally there's an assumption that women are and that's quite damaging for the opportunities of women to progress in the workplace and also quite damaging for men who want to do something different and they want to be more actively involved and I think it can be it can be easy to be at work and saving the universe as a as a man. And you know, there are plenty of men who gain enormous sort of satisfaction from the importance of their job. And I, and to just assume that it's an easy job to be at home and to be juggling both the physical and the emotional demands of looking after young children, and also the kind of practicalities of thinking ahead and not you know you 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 know not making mistakes solo solo parenting is so important because you don't have someone there to tell you what to do uh you know there are lots of great dad there are lots of uh, i shouldn't shouldn't put that in inverted commas I've, I've kind of highlighted it there are lots of great dads let's be honest there are right. lots of great dads who are responding to things that their partners are are telling them to do and that and that comes in quite early and it, it's the you know the system of paternity and maternity leave in, in you know western society reinforces that actually some of the you know estonia's got two years of maternity leave and they have the uh -huh. worst gender pay gap in the european union and it's no coincidence it's because women are taken women are paid to be not to not be working for such an extended period of time it's very difficult to rebalance that Right. But if men can do things on their own and make mistakes on their own, you only, you know, it, it, it 
creates a sense of empathy towards the role that is traditionally taken taken by women you get connected to your children in a way you don't necessarily do and you also learn that you only forget the nappy bag once you know you only forget to load the nappy bag with nappies once and nobody's there to bail you out you've got to do it yourself and you're responsible for this little you know this little baby and i think solo parenting as opposed to two you know um, people having leave at the same time that can be great but somebody is always there and i think it's and you can somebody and it's your partner usually is, is there and, and sort of helping and making sure you don't make mistakes i think men in some ways need to make childcare mistakes on their own to understand how difficult it is to get it right all the time and how just how much work there is in terms of feeding and playing and the nap and doing the washing up and the washing and all these things and the mental load side of things i think you know the more men that can experience that the more men understand an entire different part of the world that they don't necessarily they haven't traditionally seen much of other than i come home and everything seems to be done or it's all chaos and what's my wife been doing all day how outrageous is it that my house isn't tidy you know that attitude still does prevail and i think the more that men can uh, more that men can seize the opportunity to to do things on their own the easier it will become for everyone the better it will be for equality for everyone yeah it's to me it's always amazing to see pictures of like in Sweden with the, the latter dads, right? Where you yeah. have like all these young dads going around. And I think it really, it helps from a societal change perspective as well, that it becomes much more normalized. But then, you know, from what I read, it they started advertising in the 70s, right? With the, yeah. the famous wrestler with the the picture of him holding a little baby okay. and yeah so so i think it it takes time to mm. change perception so i'm always very appreciative when there's some what do you like you like a trailer place i was like okay i'm trying to change perceptions yeah. well it, it's funny because when i when i first did it i didn't have any uh, any concept of becoming a coach and coaching dads and and helping in that sense of you know that sense you know, i took two weeks i took two years um sorry two weeks leave uh and then i did four days a week and then i happened to stop work and i don't think i don't think i reflected on it too much now later on i realize there's a story there that's quite a an interesting and powerful one in terms of actually very other than breastfeeding there is nothing a man can't do for his baby yeah, that's that's my favorite line out of Rob Sturrock's book. He always, oh, yeah. you know, yes, yes, yes. I really like that. He he, he said he co it? you know he says that, and I really love that because I agree. And I think too often, unfortunately, people still have the wrong perception, or it's a stereotype where it's like, well, dads can't do care, and they can, but I think without role models to demonstrate that it is possible. It's really hard, right? What yeah. you don't see. Yeah, but I, th I think on the other hand, you know, there's lots of solo dads who, mm -hmm. for reasons of separation or, or bereavement, right. are flung in, are put into that situation, and they cope perfectly well. There's nothing. There's no kind of sadly. There's no kind of magic formula and the magic sort of ingredient to doing it. When dads need to, they can. I think exactly. there's it's a lot there's a lot to be said around the assumptions about roles gender roles that are um that can hamper uh, men and women doing things differently especially for men men i think men men really do feel the pressure and the fear of not being seen as fully committed especially when you know the reality is that in you know in the majority of heterosexual relationships then the man will be earning more in part because of some of those assumptions around mm -hmm. Um, you know, who's a better bet, who's, who's a better bet to be promoted, who do we put our, you know, investment, you know, who, who do we invest in? And, you know, you open up these gender pay gaps quite early on, and then the man feels like he can't afford, you know, often couples feel like they can't afford for the man to, to, to step back from that and to take extended leave because it may not, it may not pay and it may not be financially worthwhile. So it's a, it's a tricky jigsaw, um, but I think it's moving in the right, I like to think it's moving in the right direction you had mentioned that for you originally the identity was sort of the toughest thing to do like that it took a while for you to go away from the idea that you are a management consultant so 
can you talk about a bit more why that is so hard for the dads when they fall out of the stereotypical frame? I think, yeah, I think it's, it, it's a really interesting question, Karen, because I think it's, um, it's built into sort of, again, it's gender stereotypes about identity and, and this sense that breadwinning and caring responsibilities are separate. In the same way that, you know, working mums feel guilt about not being there and not, you know, carrying out the caring responsibilities. I think men also feel guilt or feel in some ways less of a man if they're not providing. Now, you, I think it's important to to um, to redefine providing in a much broader sense. And actually, the merging of breadwinning and caring roles is really important. As solo parents know, you can't, you know, you, there, there isn't a case for of just being a breadwinner or just being a carer um you they are they are blended yet in a lot of relationship we we seem to in relationship we seem to assume that one or other you know that that one that one part of the couple you know one one half of the couple will take on one role and one will take on the other role um so we have to sort of appreciate that for from a vast majority of men, they grew up in homes, you know, of, I'm 43, I was going to say I was 44, I'm not, it depends when this goes out, actually, I might be 44 <laughs> by the time it goes out, um, but I'm 43, but I, and I, I grew up, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s, and, you know, there weren't stay-at-home dads at all, really, mm -hmm. um, you know, mum, my, my mum stayed at home, she did little jobs, she did some, you know, she did some child, child minding, that sort of thing, my dad went out to work he was actually mm -hmm. really really flexible but men of our generation have grown up with with that culture behind them and it takes time to unpick that so i was really proud of being a management consultant i it wasn't the be all and end all by any means but there's a certain kind of kudos in some way around that you know around that sort of um type of work and it was really interesting and we did some you know we we helped some businesses and really sort of really sort of good ways to you know make more money and do things better and you know i've really enjoyed it um and i guess that just stopping and i was in a and you're in a very i was in a very female orientated environment it's you know the classes are mother and baby classes typically that's how they're advertised and i met lots of dads through a dad's group that i used to travel quite a long way to go to and it was twice a week and it was just basically dads and and kids and where I, what the thing that I noticed was whereas I was going out there and getting involved in these groups, so monkey music was a particular one, there were swimming classes, there were tumble tots, I think, as well. And I, uh, I found it relatively easy to interact and to get involved in, you know, the you know, the, the conversations with, with mums. And that never, I've, I've always had lots of female friends and that was always something that came pretty naturally to me. But I met a lot of dads who were essentially not interacting with anyone outside of their, where their partner was coming home from work and they weren't interacting during the day apart from at this dad's group on a, on a Monday and a Friday. And they just weren't going out there. They just weren't confident that it was, you know, that they would be, no, accept. I'm not sure they accept is the right way. They just weren't comfortable with being in a, in a very female orientated environment, which makes it quite difficult because you, you're not building those relationships that will, that could, you know, could help you out later on. And I found it quite sad. Um, and it was quite, it was quite noticeable that I was approaching things in a, in a slightly different way and possibly because I just was more, more comfortable doing that. So the identity thing, it took it took me a while before um, before I stopped seeing myself as a management consultant who happened to be looking after my children, and got got my head in the space where I was comfortable saying, you know, I, I this is this is what I do. I do this full time. I'm not introducing myself as a management consultant. Um, in a sense, I was lucky that I had something else. Um, so I I had I could create my identity around hockey. So. I, I, I've done a lot of field hockey umpiring um, and I got to a national league level in, in, in England and um, did that for four, did that level for four years. I might, might go back, but you know, did that for four years. But a lot of what I like, I got a lot of status out of being an elite level match official. Um, and it was almost a replacement in some ways for the work persona. So I had something that I was very good at and that I was working towards and then got to that level. So 
I almost had, yeah, I almost had something that replaced the identity. It, it wasn't a work identity, but I had something that I could hang my hat on and say, actually, I'm this, or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a dad. And I used to, you know, I, I do some consultancy. And I'm also, you know, naturally cocky on par or whatever. So having, finding something, I think that that helped to, um, that helped, I think, with my mindset of how I, how I looked at the role as a solo parent. Um, because it was it was still relatively you know there were there were dads there were this hardcore of dads at this dad's group but it was still relatively uncommon bro broader society you almost never met a dad when you're out at, you know, at these various uh mainly 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 mother and baby mother and toddler groups so there weren't too many dads around i can only imagine how hard that must be and how sort of unwelcome mon might find themselves you know if you're going somewhere and you are actually not included in the title of the the actual um you know session so yeah and i i was a management consultant myself and i remember i really enjoyed being one it's and i always felt it provides a lot of flexibility or one is very flexible so i i wonder if that might have also helped you being able to, you know, approach things and meet people and just from your background already. Yeah, yeah, it, it helps in terms of um, I could do a free, I could do freelance jobs. So after those first right. sort of nine months with Freya as a solo dad, I was then two days of work and three days with her. And then later on, I was three days with her and two days uh three three days working two days with her right so i was able to blend it which i think was really was a really important part so i could i could you know i could do an eight hour i could do eight hours of just thinking about work and i yeah i did a seven till four or something like that that was my schedule to be able to pick up the nurse do the nursery nursery pickups and stuff so it did so for for a while i did still have it so there was a, right. there was a nice transition i think in many ways right so as we are talking about transition, like in one of the articles you have written, it, it was talking about two candidates. And like, um, I was curious, like, um, so can you talk about that was sorry, the candidates meaning candidates applying for a job. Mm. And so um, can you share more about this and why that helps gender equality? Yeah, it was um, it was something. It was a graphic that I put together for a presentation a couple, of, probably a year and a half ago now, and I was trying to kind of trying to explain in a sort of simple sort of visual view as to the importance of flexible working and extended parental leave in particular in terms of gender equality, because I think you know I my, my specialism is coaching working dads and in particular paternity return to work. So men who have taken extended leave or men who perhaps are feeling the pressure of their, their work and home life and, 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 and it's a bit out of kilter and working with those, those men. Um, but that's fine, it's, but it's kind of in a, it's in a little bit of vacuum. It's kind of, for a lot of businesses, a lot of HR professionals, it's nice to have. However, the thing that's on the agenda is you know is the, is the whole diversity inclusion piece and gender pay gap and gender equality as a as a part of that um and what i wanted to understand what i wanted to demonstrate was this idea that if you had two candidates for a job and they were both say I don't know, 30 years old and there was a man and a woman and they uh, and they both were highly qualified they both have mbas they both on paper were equally um qualified for this this important new role that has been advertised and you were maybe you're down to the final two um for an interview process if you were to look at those candidates and say actually i have no idea which of these two candidates is going to want to take six months of parental leave because that's what we offer in this business or is going to want to take flex is wants to work flexibly or maybe work four days a week at some stage in the next four or five years, you know, you're imagining, you know, imagine they're at the time of their life where they might might be married, might not be anyway. They're at a similar time of their life. If you can't tell who might take leave or who might want to work flexibly, then you can't apply any sort of unconscious bias and downgrade 
the opportunity that the woman might have in that in that position if you know that those two candidates the man will only take might if they have a child will only take two weeks off and the woman can take up to six months off you might treat them differently if you have a business where there's a culture that men do not work flexibly they don't work remotely that's something for mums then you are almost certainly going to apply some kind of unconscious bias and the opportunity for that candidate that female candidate is going to be just that little bit lower than the opportunity for the male candidate and the man might be seen as a better bet for that uh, for that position but if you can equalize it then you change the dynamics of of the gender sort of equation within businesses themselves i think i think that is so important and i feel in order to have this happen it's even yeah and one really needs to sort of go beyond the um men as the breadwinner woman as the the carer so um when i talked with my previous guest rob sturick so in his book he talked about the inspiring the future uk campaign and it was a really interesting um you know initiative what they did was basically having little kids draw you know like a fighter pilot and engineer and then name these um figures that they have drawn and pretty much everybody would make them to be male and then they said you want to meet a real fighter pilot and a real yeah. surgeon and the door opens and they come all in and they're all female and i just thought it was so important because it really creates that mindset shift and as you were saying that in your question earlier the the unconscious bias right to 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 change that so mm -hmm. um now what do you have you know what have you done or like in your role as the um a coach with dad so what have you done to sort of you know change that um mindset shift i think i mean the the first and foremost one is talking about it and being visible i think and being authentically visible with the challenge and sort of demonstrating uh you know that breadwinner and carer they're not separate responsibilities um and that side of things and to be really to be really open, I mean, I've got my, my, my daughter, you know, my, my daughter's, um, I've got a, son, a daughter and a son, um, and she's, she's 10. And we, I guess as a family, we role model for both our children in terms of how we do things, in terms of that mummy is the one who, who has the proper job, as it were. <laughs> I stand grading it, I shouldn't say that. Um, mummy has the more involved job, let's put it that way. Um, and, and, and daddy is the lead parent. And I guess educating people and just sort of talking about it all the time. And um, you know, I, was, I was quite militant about baby changing facilities. If the baby changing facilities were in the female toilet, I would use the baby changing facilities in the female toilet. I would make sure there were no surprises that there was a man going in. I would make sure maybe it was quiet. I would I would go in there and I would say, I would knock on the door and I'd say, I'm changing my child. And no, I don't want him to offend him. But I would just go and do it because I thought right. it was important that, um, that I wasn't just hidden away. I wasn't because I was a dad. I had to go and hide away. Or I had to I had to change my daughter right. on the back seat of the car or whatever it might be, or find somewhere else to do it. It was like if I can if I can just put this seed of thought in 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 a you know in in people's minds about how actually this was a bit silly um, and you know some of the assumptions were were a bit daft i mean you, it's not easy to change the infrastructure in a in a church in a, in a small church in in london um, which right. is where a lot of these events a lot of these kind of uh, activities take place but i it, i thought it was important to sort of you know explain that i was a dad and therefore the changing was the important thing not where it was being done so i kind of talked about you know kind of did that um I was, I was very open in terms of the hours I would do, the work I'd take, what I could do, um, what time I'd leave work. The fact that you know when I did a Monday, Thursday, Friday on a project, then I everyone knew that I was very open. I wasn't trying to conceal that I wasn't around. I'd be like, right, okay. So on a Monday, I'd line up things for Thursday. Be very, very efficient and say, right, yeah, you know, I'm not. I can't book a. You know, I need to leave at four thirty. 
and therefore any meeting booked after you know need to finish at 4 30 oh, wow i'm actually walking out the door at 4 30. so again yeah, and i think some of that is a male privilege as well that i could i felt i could do that because i was breaking a mold and i didn't need to somehow be better i don't know i didn't need to i didn't need to fake it i could just be who i was and i think that in some ways is a, is a male privilege bit um but in terms of yeah uh, i think just challenging just being aware of language and challenging language and being quite aware of what people say when they're not really thinking about it so i would always say i would always say something if you know nice old lady would say oh are you helping mum out today it's like no actually <laughs> this is my full-time job my, my wife works you know 60 hours a week as a as a lawyer and i look after the children and i would educate one one old lady at a time that the world was a slightly different place and i wasn't helping out this was what i was doing i was a you know for all intents and purposes during the week i was a solo parent because lisa was getting home late and um you know long hours um and so just I guess just being aware of the language that people use and and correcting them and you know I will always correct so I I've got a little bit of reputation so um in our at school primary school so we have whatsapp groups for um each year group or class mm -hmm. group was one year one year group was a class group and I will always correct it when someone says mummies so dear hi all your mummies it's like and dads and I would do it all the time to the extent that people don't don't do it anymore because it's like men do not go into men are not on that WhatsApp group. It's own apart from there's like two of us. And it's just like we've got to kind of take it away from it. it's a parent group. It's not mums. Right. And don't and also they murder the English language. Some of the uh, parents anyway, with grammar and the apostrophes are all in the wrong place on mummies, which is another story altogether. But I will always correct that. I will always correct that. And so I say no. Dads can do this too. This, this, this. It's not about. It's parents. It's like, well, you know, when people say, um, "Which dad wants to referee the football match?" Well, actually, there might be a mum who wants to referee the football match. Let's not say dads. Let's actually say, "What about?" You know, well, maybe the mum. Um, I think it's important just to kind of, you know, just flip it around. So I spend a lot of time just kind of correcting people. Mm. Probably, um, my, probably annoying some of them. I'm sure. But I, I really appreciate it because I feel, you know, if if everybody were to be able or if everybody did this, it really over time, it changes perceptions. And I there is the um, the um, I guess the word or the terms called um, secret parenting for what you just described, sort of sneaking out or leaving maybe a coat at the desk to pretend one is still there when yeah. one in reality is maybe looking after a kid or, or watching a football match of the kid. And I think especially, you know, as there are still more say male um, managers or senior managers, if they take a stand and say, I am leaving now because I'm doing something with my child, I think it really sets an important role yeah. model. So I'm very appreciative that you you know go beyond that like with the elderly lady what you were just describing and um so and, and you know so in one of your articles you were quoting um melinda gates mm. from her latest book and so yeah. could you share the story for people who have not um read her book yeah so this this was an article on linkedin and it was it was referencing the article itself is called the massive hidden cost of women's unpaid work and it was a great story about the importance of male senior leadership and it's exactly what you're just saying Karen in terms of uh, men in senior positions sort of being open about right I am parenting I'm leaving early because I'm going to do this or this is what I'm doing not just blocking the diary and making it a secret meeting as if you're meeting a recruiter you know putting it putting it in the diary as what it you know what you're doing and being open and honest about active and involved parenting and it's especially important for senior male leadership models because those are the role models that men in the workplace tend to look to they tend to take their cues and there's lots of research around this they take their cues from the senior male role models in the workplace say how what are they doing how do i get ahead how do i how do i get promoted ultimately how do i move up the ladder actually i need to behave in the way that the people above me are behaving in. and they look around and they look at men and they often see 
Oh, uh, I, uh, an older generation of men who perhaps you know who, whose wives didn't work, who who weren't actively involved in their in their um, family's upbringing, and maybe have a quite a sort of remote relationship with their children, and that's what they see, and that's and if we can break that, it's really really good. So the Belinda Gates and Bill Gates story was about when um, it goes back to two thousand and one. I've got the, got my notes here. <laughs> pen, yes, yes, pen yes. A bit today. I've got it. <laughs> I've got it on one note, so I, I can find it quite easily. Um, and it was when their daughter was really young, and uh, it was to do with where the kindergarten was, and actually it was more convenient for Bill to take their daughter to kindergarten. It was for um, Melinda to take their daughter to kindergarten. And so he and he said, well, can I why don't I do it? So it makes it a bit easier for you. Um, and um, when I complained to Bill and so this is the quote from the article, when I complained to Bill about all the time I'd be spending in the car, he said, I can do some of that. And he says, yeah, it'd be giving me time to talk to Jen. So Bill started driving. He'd leave our house, drop Jen at school, turn around, drive past back our neighborhood and on to Microsoft. Twice a week he did it. About three weeks in, on my days, I noticed, started noticing a lot of dads dropping kids off in the classrooms. So I went up to one of the mums and said, hey, what's up? There's a lot of dads here. She said, when we saw Bill driving, we went home and said to our husband, Bill Gates is driving his child to school. You can too. And it's just such a beautiful illustration about the power of role modeling. Thank you. Yeah, I... I just, I love this story and I really feel like, you know, anybody listening to us today who is in a position of leadership, if he or she can take a moment, maybe next week and really make a point if they're leaving to do something related to children, it really makes a difference because what mm. you were just saying, right, within three weeks when she was back, yeah. all of a sudden, so it's, yeah, so it, it made, I, Bill Gates made it OK for the other dads exactly. to not to be there, maybe perfectly on time to be to be taking, you know, doing things differently. And I think that's the important thing. And also not just for I think not just for leaders to demonstrate their own um, sort of parenting, but also to find out what sort of things that their staff need and to be actively seek out and not just to assume that a man doesn't require um, flexible working and a woman does, because sometimes that won't be the case, and not to assume just based on gender, but to go and actively find out, especially in this sort of post-COVID world, or so post-COVID world, I mean, it's um, rather optimistic, really, but right. in, a, in, a, in a world where, certainly in the UK, where a lot of people have been working remotely and flexibly, and are now being asked to go back into the office offices, then just finding out on a human level what people need in terms in order to make their work and their life balance and work together is really important and not just assume it's by gender. Thank you. And it, you're bringing me to my next point. Also, I love to talk more about flexible work with basically anybody who would like to listen because I feel so strongly about it because to me it is a barrier for so many you know situations mm. if it does not exist and so i've seen that you're presenting at the flexpo very soon so could you tell our listeners a bit about that yeah so flexpo is a uh, event that was started last year and it's an initial initial incarnation was about connecting uh, it was a combination of both of connecting job seekers with companies who had flexible jobs that they were advertising, but also an element of thought leadership around that as well. Uh, it's now into this year, it's in two different um, events. Uh, Flexpo Business is next, uh, next Wednesday is when we're recording it. This is, um, it'll be the 16th of September, and it is an opportunity for HR professionals to get together uh, virtually. Um, there'll be stands, virtual stands, uh, an auditorium where you, where you can listen and listen live and then listen back to a, a number of kind of um, panel panel sessions. I think there's about 10 panel sessions. Um, yeah, and I'm involved in one of the panel sessions. So we're I'm, I'm talking with Jane Van Zyl from the charity Working Families in the UK. And we're talking about understanding what COVID-19 has revealed about gender bias in the UK, how we respond to accelerate the pace of change. And so this is it plays to the things I'm really interested in, which is joining the dots between 
um, men's uh, work-life balance and the broader challenge around sort of gender equality and making sure that flex flexible working genuinely is for everyone there are options options for everyone to get involved um, because it gives people choices and it, it it opens up you know from a talent point of view it opens up the market and allows you to reach um, and potentially employ a lot more people if you are able to be flexible and you know you know there are so many jobs that can be done on a flexible basis or a remote basis or a part-time basis or a job share basis that just sometimes needs um, just a, a reframing of um, what success looks like in the workplace and where work has to be done because a lot of places it doesn't have to be done where we think it needs to be done it's a lot of that is just about face time and which is important but it's about you know it, it's about managers seeing people and feeling getting confidence from seeing people rather than seeing the outputs so um yeah no really really pleased to be involved in flexpo again um yeah i went, went along last year met loads of people who i'd previously only met on linkedin so mm -hmm. that was um that was a real hollow and got to talk about sort of that connecting the joining the dots between um between men dads and uh and, and the broader broader challenges around gender pay gap and gender diversity it's a really great opportunity for uh people within within the H hr in particular and business leaders to discuss and to get insight into how to make you know how to make flexible working work especially in what will be a challenging two or three years i suspect and flexible working will be a major part of business success i think and the ability to work flexibly will be a key key differentiator i think between businesses that survive and thrive and businesses that struggle i i completely agree with you and uh, you know as you know the name of my show job sharing and beyond right pretty much shows like i i feel very strongly mm. about flexible working now one thing i wanted to um address i i could talk with you forever ian but um we are coming to an end and um so basically a lot of the times people still have the feeling that somebody who is a carer at home you know maybe is on a vacation or does very little and so i think sometimes what people struggle with is if they want to return to um, paid work after a long period of absence um you know it's perceived to be a career gap instead of a lot of skills soft skills that people have learned so um and even the world economic forums now mm. emphasizes soft skills as important skills for the future so could you from your experience share a bit what would be sort of the top um soft skills or skills you have learned having been um a, a full-time carer i think um patience is probably one of the one of the big things they i think i think there are lots of there are lots of managers and leaders who um will slip into the kind of do it do as i uh do as i say kind of mentality and that you know that clearly that has a role in parenting as well but it won't it's not a role that you can you know you can't keep that up for very long so i think the, the kind of patience with patience with people who need to be coached ultimately you know a lot of parenting is actually i think in many ways it's, it's about coaching it's about explaining what the outcome is that we want to happen talking about how we want to do it prepping people talking about it in advance you know you don't want to surprise excuse me you don't want to surprise a five-year-old is what you're going to do today and suddenly say right we need to be out of the house now it's like we set it we set the ground rules we have a diary we understand what we, the outcomes are we explain that you know what we need to do in terms of getting dressed and maybe we and we make interventions but without stifling them so those kind of skills uh and sort of patience is certainly one of those those kind of man management skills are are really important negotiating um you know if you can negotiate with a toddler <laughs> yeah. you can yes. negotiate with anyone quite frankly i think um and looking for win-wins um it's you know you you know your life is much easier when you're looking after young children if they if you get what you want and they also get or perceive to have got what they want so those kind of yeah, that's negotiation time management i think is is also massively 
important in terms of um, and and just any kind of project management side of things and be able to mentally juggle and understand the uh, you know understand what needs to happen and when in order and in what order in order for things to uh, to work so there's an element of um, there's an element of kind of lean manufacturing principles in terms of mm -hmm. getting out the door at the time where you want to um, I get a lot of soft skills practice from hockey umpiring as well I must admit in terms of um, sort of body language and authority and um, setting boundaries and things like that and saying well this is what we accept and this isn't what we accept and there are consequences so I, I also get quite a lot from quite a lot from that but yeah I think there's there's so many um, so many things from parenting that that fit I think maybe people don't think about it they sometimes it, I think too often people uh, I, I guess um, less so dads because dads men tend to have an overinflated sense of their own abilities in some, some cases yeah, that old old adage that uh you know you put a job spec in front of a man the man will go brilliant i can do three of these things three of these 10 things and the woman looks at it, oh my god there's seven i can't do um and so that attitude is very different but i think sometimes um sometimes women think of themselves as only mums and i think they right. do themselves an you know an entire disservice by by seeing their uh, their experience in that way. Now, is there anything today that you would like to talk about that we have not addressed yet? I'll try and do it quickly because I know I like I like, I like to have, I like to talk so um, and I appreciate <laughs> appreciate the time. Um, I think you know one of the things I really wanted to uh, impress upon people listening is the importance of shared fa family goals. Mm -hmm. I think um, certainly for guys then. Um, we can often get caught up in the importance of our work, important, important and, and it is important for mental health and various other aspects and, and status and, and identity, but sometimes we can get blinkered. And I think it's really important to understand what's truly important to you, which may not be your work in the way that you think, um, but also then look to open up the lines of communication with your partner if you have a partner, so that you have a sense of shared um, shared family goals so you've got a kind of compass that you're going in i mean for us felisa and i it goes back you know 10 10 or so years and our you know our big thing was one of us will always be there for the kids uh, and so we always kind of prioritize that and i you know i've you know I'll, I've, I've stepped away and said no to lots of things over the years because i didn't think it was fair on on that sort of overriding principle so i think having that shared purpose and open and honest communication in terms of um, in terms of couples so everyone's needs are being met and I think that's really really important um, especially if you're trying to do something outside of the the norm that you've established maybe as a family uh, and or, or of your circumstances certainly if you're, um, you're you're trying to break out of that then understanding what each other needs and what's important I think is a really really important um, part of it and yeah mental load uh I th you know it tends to be something that women are much more um aware of than the men it's the the administrative burden of joining all the dots of family life and it falls much more much more likely to fall on the woman um and for men i think the watch out would be that if you're being told what to do by your by your partner then you probably aren't on the front foot with that and you you probably need to start thinking about what can i do that would make life easier for us as a couple that i can do without being told or asked to do because actually when you're being asked to do it someone else is managing you effectively and you are just you are just the lackey who's doing things and that might be fine for you but someone's got to think about all the things that need to be done and typically that's your your partner so Guys, so so for me, a couple of things would be yeah, um, shared shared family direction, family goals, and understanding what they are, and for men to understand uh, mental load. And any solo parenting you do, that helps you to understand the mental load. So you almost you almost want to take a weekend. We so right, I'm in, you know ne next weekend, daddy's in charge of the kids, and mummy's going off to see her friends. Um, and then you know she's turning her phone off so you can't ask questions and i think anything like that is 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 you know very instructive and educational for men and and does put a different perspective on the roles that uh, and the roles in, in which in parenting and the things that we do 
I think that sounds like an excellent exercise because I'm sure after these two days, the perception of what appears to be from, you know, like super easy or doesn't take that much time, all of a sudden is like, wow. Yes. So I, I think that's yeah. great. Now, how can people contact you, Ian? So, yeah, uh, the best place to go is inspiringdads.co.uk where I've got links to social media. I'm very active on LinkedIn in particular. There's a Facebook page, a Facebook group for working dads. Uh, you can sign up to my, uh, my PDF, which is all about um, creating goals that really succeed. And that's, um, that's aimed at dads in particular, but it works for parents, but it's about five core principles that help you create goals that really succeed um, and there's a whole load of other resources there in terms of links to videos links to the podcast that i do lockdown dads uh, and blog articles and that sort of thing so there's a whole range of range of bits and pieces so it all it's all link it all links through inspiringdads.co.uk well, thank you. It was so nice to have you on the show, Ian. So thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure, Karen. Thank you very much for having me on. It's great to, uh, great to talk, about the, uh, talk about this topic with a kindred spirit. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to the show. We hope you gained valuable insights and new ideas. To keep listening to future episodes, please head over to iTunes or your favorite player and subscribe and give it a rating. We would very much appreciate a review and for you to share it on social media so more people can start innovating in how they offer employment. Until the next time, goodbye.